For more on the election and what it means for Venezuela and the United States, I'm joined by Cynthia Arnson, director of the Latin America program at the Wilson Center, and Mark Weisbrot, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Cindy Arnson, let me start with you. Enrique Capriles has formally requested the cancellation of the official event to certify the results. Given the state of play in Venezuela, is that result, as far as we know it now, likely to hold up? I think the result is likely to hold up, but the real question is uh, the, uh, under what process and whether there will be a recount that will be accepted by the opposition as legitimate. One of the difficulties in this is that the institutions of the government have been so stacked over the years by Chavista supporters that their independence, I think, is really called into question, certainly by the opposition as well as a lot of people in the international community. The very electoral council that ratified the vote last night um, is, is four out of five members, you know, who are considered um, Chavistas, whether they're hardline Chavistas or Chavista light. Um, they are still people who are close to, uh, to the PSUV. There's one opposition person. So the real question is, you know, how do you affirm the legitimacy in the eyes of the Venezuelan people of this very narrow victory, um, quite surprising given the polls? Mark Weiss brought the uh, opposition candidate, has requested a full recount. Given what it says in Venezuelan electoral law, is he likely to get it? Is it hard to get? Well, let me give you some context here, I think, for your listeners and viewers. I think the only reason we're having a discussion about the legitimacy of the Venezuelan election or having all this news and all the negative news, really, that you hear about Venezuela almost every day, it's about 90 percent negative, uh, is uh, there are two reasons. One is that this is uh, probably the most important target for regime change from the United States government, and uh, two, it has uh, 500 billion barrels of oil, approximately. And those two things are, are related. And I think that's why we're having this. I mean, let's face it, in 2006, there was an election in Mexico where uh, Calderon won by 0.6 percent, uh, about a third of the margin that, that, um, uh, that Maduro had. And what did the U.S. government do? They, they congratulated him before there was any kind of even announcement or official announcement of the, of the that he won, and then they organized an international campaign to legitimate this election. They supported them when they not only refused the recount, but refused to even divulge. Absent American congratulations or not, what does Venezuelan law say about whether or not Capriles can get a recount? Because is he likely to get? One? Oh, he doesn't have any entitlement to a recount, and you already have. You know, the Venezuelan system is very secure. That's why Jimmy Carter called it the best in the electoral process in the world. They already audited 54 percent of the votes. Statistically, they do that right there. They take, you know, there's two copies of every vote. You push a touch screen, you get a receipt, you get to look at it, you put it in a ballot box. So unlike our system, where we don't really know who won when, when it's close election, they know. I mean, they, had 50, they take a random selection of 54 uh, percent for an audit, and they look at the machine, and they make sure it counts up with the ballot, and they do it in front of the opposition witnesses. And that's already been done. That's done on, at the election. So... Uh, you know, the difference between a 100 percent and a 54 percent random sample in this uh, situation is statistically not really that, that much. It's, it's, it's almost uh, trivial. Cindy Arnson, if that margin does hold up, as, as both of you suggest it's likely to do, is Maduro a weakened president because of the closeness of the election? The president of the National Assembly, one of his rivals, said the results oblige us to make profound self-criticism. It's a divided country, huh? It's a very divided country, and I think that the that um, as a result of the narrow margin, Nicolás Maduro has nowhere the mandate that he had been hoping for. Last October, President Chávez won that election with close to 11 percent of the popular vote, and all of the polls going into these last days, you know, before the election, showed that Maduro continued to enjoy a reduced but still a six or seven percent lead. And to have that down to the point that the opposition is calling for a recount because they don't trust, you know, uh, the final count shows that, um, that the country is far more divided and there were far more defections from the governing party, from the PSUV, than anyone had anticipated, including the, the pollsters that over time have shown themselves to be the most credible. So he goes into this uh, with a very weakened mandate, with, a, with difficulty in keeping together the Chavista coalition, in resolving the deep 
problems um, of the economy in light of a devaluation in resolving the atrocious situation of crime and violence in the country. Um, how he will keep uh, those various factions of the party together and at the same time tackle these very deep-seated problems is, is, really, um, is really a big question. And I think it leaves open the possibility for a great deal uh, more instability. It sounds like it's going to be difficult to run Venezuela, whoever takes the oath of president. Get 30-plus percent inflation, high crime. Those, those facts are... It was 20 percent last year. And uh, it's picked up a little in the last few months, but um, or significantly in the last few months. And I think that was part of the problem for, for Maduro. No, I think there are serious challenges ahead, but, you know, we don't want to exaggerate them too much. I mean, for 14 years, the business press has been saying that the Venezuelan economy is going to collapse, and it never did, and it, it won't either. You know, they always say it's unsustainable. I mean... Unsustainable is what we had in 2006 here when you have an $8 trillion housing bubble and anybody who's looking at it, which unfortunately didn't include the majority of the economics profession, uh, knows that when it collapses, it's going to collapse and you're going to have a terrible recession. They don't have those kinds of imbalances. What they have is a problem of stabilizing the exchange rate. You know, they had growth. Uh, they've had growth now for almost three years for uh, two and a half of those years, right up to the last quarter of last year, right up to the election. They were growing quite rapidly, accelerating 5.6% last year, and inflation was falling all, during all that time. It's just picked up in the last few months. So it is possible for them to resolve those problems, and the collapse that all the people who don't like Venezuela uh, are waiting for is really uh, very unlikely to happen. Let me get a quick back and forth from you both before we close on what's at stake for the Venezuelans and the Americans in the U.S.-Venezuela relationship. Cindy? Well, the United States continues to be Venezuela's largest uh, export market, and that will probably continue. It's not been very successful in diversifying its, um, its, its uh, purchasers of, of Venezuelan oil. It's a very heavy, sulfur-laden kind of crude, and it's um, very difficult to, uh, to ship it for, you know, ex uh, great distances. I think the, the, biggest, um, the biggest problem um, in the relationship is going to be the continuing um, uh, rhetorical uh, attacks on the U.S. government as having caused the cancer of Hugo Chavez and uh, plotting to assassinate the opposition candidate, Capriles, to blame the government. I mean, the constant barrage of attacks on the United States that suggest anything but, um, you know, and suggest that there, there will be a very difficult moment ahead. And, Mark, quickly? Yes. Well, the New York Times reported today that uh, Maduro reached out through Bill Richardson to the U.S. government to try and improve relations. And I think you saw the answer today. The statement from the White House was much worse than the one from the State Department that you played. They actually said, you know, we believe it's necessary for you to have a uh, hundred percent audit of your votes. That is very, very rude, nasty thing to say. It's basically hate speech. Tell another government, one that you supported a military coup against, and uh, I won't even talk about our own elections here, and, and uh, you, to tell them how their elections should be run. So, and, and to take openly the side of the opposition. And it's very disturbing because if they just wanted that, they wouldn't say it publicly. They did it uh, knowing that it would cause uh, trouble. And that's what uh, I'm really worried about right now. Mark Weisbrot, Cindy Arnson, thank you both. Thank you.